Hi, this is President Donald Trump, and I need Alabama to go vote for Roy Moore. There's a Senate election in Alabama tomorrow. Republican Roy Moore is a suspended state Supreme Court justice and suspected pedophile. Doug Jones is a Democrat and a former U.S. attorney. It's a big deal, but you wouldn't know it if you spent the weekend in Alabama that I spent. It's quiet around here. It snowed here, and it usually doesn't. It's Alabama, not Minnesota. So when the flakes started to fall, most people stayed home Friday and Saturday. But not Doug Jones. He imported an all-star cast of Democrats from the North to help him stump all over the state. His canvassers are everywhere Democrats need them to be this weekend. Roy Moore? He wasn't even here. Now, Roy Moore isn't doing any real campaigning today or tomorrow that we can see on the schedule, really. Is that, is that something we should worry about? Does that, does that matter, do you think? Roy know. is at the Army-Navy game today uh -huh. to see his son. So that's where he was yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Moore's mostly avoided press and places where he might run into voters who might ask him awkward questions about those allegations. But he is talking to some people, namely people who like him a lot. He needs those folks to vote and in big numbers. It's God's will what happens. Last night in Montgomery, he appeared at a Christmas party with some supporters. Conservative outlets like Breitbart were the only ones allowed to cover it. Here in Midland tonight, he's hosting a rally. Steve Bannon's on the guest list. More supporters are convinced he's gonna win. They say they've beaten back the allegations of pedophilia and that normalcy has returned to Alabama. Normalcy, of course, meaning that if a Republican's on the ballot, a Republican will win. So what do you think are the characteristics of a really, really good senator? These people are so sure of themselves that Moore's allies at Trump's super PAC actually released a video today of Moore being interviewed by a tween girl. So that's either confidence or the ballsiest thing I've ever seen. But last minute polling tells a different story from the one that Moore supporters want to tell. A Fox News poll of around 1,100 Alabama voters has Doug Jones with an astonishing 10-point lead today. The reason for that? An enthusiasm gap. Not surprisingly, Jones' support comes from non-white voters, younger voters, and voters who are women. He's the choice of non-white voters by 76 points. For voters under the age of 45, he's winning by 31 points. With women, he's up by 20 points. And that jumps to 46 points among women under the age of 45. Moore has a 20-point lead among whites. And for whites without a college degree, he's up 33 points. But more Democrats say they plan to vote for Jones than Republicans say they plan to vote for Moore. And 29% of Moore's supporters say they have reservations about their candidate, while just 13% of Jones' supporters say the same thing. But the more people I've been speaking with are still extremely confident. A source close to the campaign told me last night that their internal polling shows Moore up by between five and seven points. This is Alabama after all. And you don't need to look back very far, like say a year, to find a Republican candidate who's controversial, with sexual harassment allegations over him, who voters weren't super thrilled about saying they wanted to vote for when pollsters asked. But if Jones does pull off this upset and Moore loses this thing, he might wish he spent more time campaigning this weekend and less time watching football. The most destructive fire season in history continues to devastate Southern California. More than 200,000 people have been evacuated in the past week alone. There's nothing firefighters can do about the strong winds and dry conditions that are keeping the flames burning. But there is something they can do to make wildfires less destructive, if they can convince the public that not all fire is dangerous. When there are mega wildfires, the message that we're starting to hear from the public and from politicians is put these fires out. Fire's bad. It's not bad. It was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Experts like William Basie know that there is a right time for fire. Intentional controlled burns called prescribed fires clear out dead wood and small trees that otherwise become fuel for dangerous uncontrolled wildfires. 
Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for showing up, Colorado folks. My name's Rob Wilson. I'm gonna be the burn boss training today. So we're gonna have four burn groups kind of working together. For the new folks, it's about 4,000 acres. We do have some identified spots in the event. We do need to airlift somebody out of there. What we're doing is putting fire on the landscape in a controlled manner so that we can bring the ecosystem back to, you know, the way it should be. You can do that and kind of zigzag, zigzag in yeah. here. Yeah. Well, I zigzag between yeah. your spot and Andy. Works for me, cool. So instead of going in and suppressing all the fires right away, sometimes we have the opportunity to come in and work with fire, fight fire with fire, so that we can eliminate some of the catastrophic fire that happens. Hey, just checking in with you guys since uh, the burger started headed south, man. Um, I'm guessing no news is good news. Everything's holding all right up there. And we're going to go to the 734 trail or uh, road there and hold up there. Prescribed fires are based on very old knowledge. It's a technique that Native Americans used for centuries. But Europeans had different ideas because modern forestry was developed in the 19th century in Germany, where forests are wet and rarely burn. Those 5, the U.S. Forest Service embraced that mindset when it began managing the vast public lands in the American West, making fire of any kind the enemy. It's a message hammered into generations of kids by a familiar icon. This is the Morgan family coming home from the lake. Oh, so Smokey the Bear was a very successful public campaign um, in the 40s. Today, Ed will become a killer. And here's his weapon. Unfortunately, it has ingrained in a number of people uh, an attitude that is against fire. Smith says that attitude is backwards and that it's responsible for the devastation we're seeing today. I have never seen a fire season like this because of the destructiveness of the fires and the swiftness, the speed at which the fires have moved across the landscape. So by putting out fires for so long, we've set ourselves up for really bad fires. There's good evidence from a number of areas that have burned in recent megafires, including the Rim Fire of 2013, the King Fire of 2014, that proactive work like reintroducing fire through prescribed burns uh, can really reduce the risk and reduce the severity of a fire when it does hit those landscapes. Despite the evidence, California's forest managers burn just 10 to 30,000 acres a year. By comparison, this year's uncontrolled fires have already burned more than a million acres in the state. Over half of the Forest Service budget goes to fire suppression. That means putting the fires out, keeping them small, air tankers, bulldozers. So the amount of money that actually goes towards prescribed burning is very little. As we, the climate starts getting warmer, drier, hotter in, in a lot of places, it's going to take more firefighters to put out these fires. I'm not the lay midwife that you would think of, somebody who maybe goes to a home and, and does a home birth. There's a real calling for some people to do home births, but, but I don't do that. I can admit patients, I can discharge patients, I can prescribe medications. Maybe I'll do one or two deliveries a day. I can go back to the OR and assist a doctor in a C-section. So our scope is really wide. Nobody has an idea what a midwife is, and that's why we educate them. If I own it and I'm excited about it, I say, hey, my name is Commander Lashba, and I'm a certified nurse midwife, and I'm here to take care of you. It's the trust factor that we're talking about. Hello, how are you? You know it's a girl? How do you know it's a girl? Any, like, clues? I don't know. It's, like, the weirdest gut feeling. So if I tell you it's a boy today, or are you going to, how are you going to behave? I mean, I'll be really excited because I love the name we have picked out. Midwife comes from Old English means with woman. We're by the bedside the whole time. We labor them, we help them breathe through their contractions. It's a holistic environment. 
There's a leg. And they're together right now. So we'll just have to be patient and wait. Maybe it's a lady because she's being very ladylike right now. Keeping her legs together. Okay, let's see. I think you're right. You are. There's the V. One line, two lines, three lines. That's a girl. Yes. That's awesome. It is exciting. I was a nurse for 10 years and had so much interest in it that I wanted to provide midwifery care for, for patients. So I'm a master's prepared nurse midwife. How are you doing? I see patients every 20 minutes. Generally, my work week consists of four eight-hour days or nine-hour days and then one call day of 24 hours. Hi, this is Commander Lashbaugh. Is anybody in labor right now? Is there anybody in triage? Nobody on the deck. Okay, thanks a lot. See, not only am I a midwife, I'm also a sailor. I'd say that midwifery falls in line with Navy Corps values, honor, courage, and commitment. And we make sure we do our job by caring for that sailor. And we are a family. We're, we're a big family. Okay, so we have everybody's stuff. Everybody get a snack. So welcome to Centering. Centering is a way that we can provide care for our pregnant women in a group setting. Okay, who in here has experienced a contraction? What does it feel like? Awful. It feels terrible. <laughs> a lot of our women here in the Navy don't have families and friends around, and they're, they're isolated, and they may be away from home for the very first time. And to get in this Navy family type of setting where you're going to be in with a lot of other pregnant women, they're going to be able to bond with each other, they're going to grow their babies together at the same time, same gestation. It just feels like severe menstrual cramps. Yeah. Where you don't really want to stand up. Yeah, and I could feel the baby's head down, so. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of done being pregnant. You're like, that's it. <laughs> it's your choice. What would you like to do today? It would be nice to have the baby. <laughs> so do you want me to induce you today? Sure. Okay. I, I think for such a long time in medicine, we have dictated yeah. to patients <laughs> what they're supposed to do. With midwifery, we're able to give people the necessary education to make their own decisions and to empower them to make their own decisions. This is the eviction notice. This is the eviction notice. Yep. It is the most rewarding experience bringing life into this world, del delivering a baby. I mean, every single time. It's a birthday. Every day is a birthday. And everybody enjoys celebrating right, birthdays. Right. Bitcoin is soaring again today, on one of the dates many investors predicted it would crash. The volatile cryptocurrency began trading on the futures market on Sunday, but more people are betting on it than against it. So for now, the frenzy will continue. Bitcoin has no government behind it and no physical currency to represent it. Bubble or not, many people have put enormous faith in Bitcoin, driving its value from $800 to nearly $20,000 in less than a year. It's been a wild ride for Bitcoin investors, who range from shrewd financiers and lucky dilettantes to Vice News' own Jay Caspian Kang. I'm Jay Kang, and this is my life in the Bitcoin bubble. When I think back on the last six months of Bitcoin, I don't really remember any of the the good moments. Unprecedented. Inconceivable. Bitcoin has been surging lately. I don't remember when it hit 5,000 for the first time. I don't remember when it hit 6,000 for the first time. I just remember the crashes. This thing became make-believe in the last two weeks. And if you're stupid enough to buy, you'll pay the price. And this will all have ended, and it will end very badly. Earlier this summer, I went to a barbecue my friend was having. He came up to me and said, I'm making $500 a day on this Bitcoin thing. $500 a day sounded pretty good to me, and also FOMO in crypto is probably the most powerful emotion I've ever felt about any form of money or gambling. And, you know, this is somebody who spent much of his 20s playing poker, trying to play poker for a living. My first investment was for about $4,000. When I started, I would read a lot of forums on Reddit and other places where people who have gotten rich off Bitcoin would talk about the things that they did. If I had stuck to that, I would probably have two and a half times what I've made now if I had just done that. My wife has asked me not to talk about Bitcoin so much with her. 
when she met me, every day I went surfing and all I thought about was surfing. And that was a good one because I was like in good shape and I guess surfing is cool. As I've grown older, those obsessions have gotten nerdier and worse. At some point I was like checking my phone and I, I think I was up like 55% in the first week and a half. And I was like, this is, you know, I'm gonna be rich off of this. And then some news came out of China that people were saying that China was gonna ban Bitcoin and ICOs and other forms of cryptocurrency. Bitcoin crashed and went down about 40%. And I decided that to sort of deal with the losses that I was taking, that I would take about three Bitcoin at the time and bet it all in a Bitcoin casino on a soccer game between like two teams that had, I had never seen play. And then I lost that bet, and so all the Bitcoin that I had then was gone. That Bitcoin I lost now is worth about like a Audi A4 with you know, a souped up engine, I guess. Everybody's a genius right now because everybody's getting rich. I just think it's going crazy right now. Anytime Bitcoin goes up anything more than 5%, I have like a full body experience and I start sweating. And then, <laughs> and then I'll just stare at my phone for the next hour. Yeah, 42 messages about Bitcoin from a friend of mine who uh, is trying to convince the rest of our Bitcoin group text that we should all be like fearing absolute destruction in the next two days. I hope it doesn't get destroyed. You know, if I lose it all, it's fine. Ugh. Like many Western countries, France has a growing elderly population and a rapidly rising number of seniors at risk of isolation and neglect. And as in countries all over the world, French people are also sending fewer letters by mail, leaving their 73,000 postal workers with a lot more time on their hands. Now, the French Post thinks it might be able to solve both problems with a new service called Watch Over My Parents. For about $34 a month, postal workers will visit lonely seniors to check on their health, bring them groceries, or just hang out. 2,500 people have already signed up, many of them in the country's rural villages. Je suis Madame Michine Feder du Jardin. J'habite à Hirschen et je suis née ici il y a 87 ans. <laughs> mon mari est décédé en 96 et je suis seule depuis ce moment-là. Quand vous êtes seule, c'est pas toujours facile. Ah non, euh, je ne suis pas sur un nuage rose, gris, mais pas rose. C'est un village très calme, il est très calme. C'est plus la même mentalité. Parce que c'est tous des jeunes qui arrivent. Ils habitent le village, mais ils ne vivent pas avec le village. Il n'y a plus l'entente qu'il y avait avant. Non, plus du tout. Tous les matins, j'emprunte ce chemin euh, afin de distribuer euh, dans deux villages distincts. Payer sur mes parents a commencé en mai 2017, hein, aussi pour pallier à la baisse du trafic de courrier. Et c'est parti. À travers euh, mes tournées, j'ai pu constater qu'il euh, y avait euh, des personnes isolées qui étaient euh, par moments... Euh, bah, il n'y avait pas de visite chez elles. Donc on était le seul lien euh, journalier euh, lors de nos passages. Vous pouvez me poster ça, ça Oui, il n'y a pas de souci, merci. <rire> Chaque année, on a une baisse des volumes de courrier d'environ 5%. Notre modèle d'affaires, il faut qu'on le transforme. Et pour ça, il faut qu'on se diversifie. Et il faut qu'on confie à nos facteurs des, des tâches autres que celles de distribuer du courrier. Euh, et ce service, en fait, on l'a imaginé il y a quelques années, lorsque euh, des mairies ont fait appel à nous pour rendre visite à des personnes âgées en cas de canicule. Et les mairies qui s'inquiétaient pour les seniors euh, nous ont demandé d'aller rendre visite et de vérifier que tout allait bien. Ce service-là, on devrait être capable de le rendre tout le temps. Et cette année, on va, on va avoir recruté en fin d'année 3000 facteurs. Je suis obligé de forcer un petit peu sur la porte parce qu'elle est un peu sourde d'oreille. Euh, alors. Bonjour Madame Fédère. Bonjour facteur. Vous allez bien Très bien. Ça a été votre week-end Votre week-end 
Votre week-end s'est bien passé De quoi Est-ce que vous avez besoin d'ici jeudi Oui, d'accord. Est-ce que, est que vous avez besoin qu'une personne vienne oui. euh, vous faire des courses ou c'est bon Oui, d'accord, entendu. Alors, Madame Fénère, c'est vrai que c'est quelqu'un de, de très spécial pour moi. Ça aurait pu être ma grand-mère. Je suis un des seuls contacts qu'elle peut avoir euh, dans la journée. Et puis c'est vrai, je lui rends pas mal de petits services, mais c'est un enrichissement personnel. Je pense que tous les deux, on a créé un lien euh, fort. C'est-à-dire que, enfin, sans dire du moins, je, pas de mal. Vis-à-vis d'un homme, euh, pour moi, il y a un, une certaine, euh, on peut dire, distance à prendre. Merci, Fauteur. Je vous remercie beaucoup de votre accueil. Oui, encore. Merci. That's Vice News Tonight for Monday, December 11th.